Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, yes, apparently so. Um, before we start, we will be recording this session. Um, if you wish not to appear, please turn off your camera and you can also modify your name if you uh, wish to remain anonymous. I would also ask you to please um, turn off your microphones um, so that we can hear our speakers. Um, welcome. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sandra Vaca. I am a member of Comco and working at the Documentation Center and Museum of Migration in Germany. Together with my colleagues Anna Leschenko and Andina Gomova, um, I will moderate today's event. Uh, Anna is a researcher at the University of Tübingen and vice chair um, in ICOMS International Committee um, for Museology. And Alina works for the Foundation New Synagogue Berlin Centrum Judaicum and is member of ICOM Comco. Our colleague Simon Bosch is our technique expert today. Thank you very much for the technical support. So today's discussion, Museums and Partnerships in Times of War in Ukraine, um, is part of an online series um, called Making Museums Matter. These lectures and talks um, are inspired by the debates about the new museum definition of ICOM, and um, they seek to rethink museum work in German-speaking countries. Together with international guests like today, we look at international museum theories, concept practices, um, and ethics as well, and we reflect how on how they could be introduced and implemented um, here to change existing uh, ideas about museums' role, social relevance, and responsibility, making museums matter. Our partner institution for this series are the University of Würzburg, the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage, KAMA, at uh, the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, ICOM Comco, the Volkskundemuseum, Univers Universalmuseum Joanneum, the Zürcher Hochschule der Künste, Master of Arts in Art Education, Curatorial Studies, uh, in Forschungsschwerpunkt Kulturanalyse in Künsten, and the Ludwig Uhland Institut für Empirische Kulturwissenschaften, Universität Tübingen. Thank you to all our partners for supporting us. Um, today, we will address a topic that has sadly been highly relevant for the last uh, few months. Um, the brutal and aggressive war um, unleashed by Russia and Ukraine on February 24th, 2022, is driving more and more people to flee every day and causing massive destruction. And we have, have asked ourselves, how can Ukrainian colleagues continue their work um, against the backdrop of permanent threats? to their life, um, historical buildings, and also, of course, the collections. And what role does cultural and natural heritage play in this war? Um, what forms of cooperation and resource sharing can museums abroad us, offer to provide support and solidarity and counter the rise of fascism? In this session of um, Museum, Making Museums Matter event series, we have invited colleagues from Ukraine, Poland, Austria, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Europe, the US to report on the needs on forms of resistance, on strategies of networking and possibilities of preservation. Together with them and later with you, dear audience, we hope to talk about the experiences and strategies, but also about traps and gaps in the current wave of solidarity uh, with the Ukraine, as well as promote global and local networking of museums and their partners in these terrible times of war. Um, in preparation to this session, we've asked our guests to read the Icon for Ukraine report, which you will also find um, in our chat. Maybe we can post a link to it if it's available. Um, I would very much like to thank our guests and to welcome them. Uh, welcome them. That's uh, Rosalina Bössel, uh, Basil Dunietz, Robert Firmhofer, Julia Fisch, Oksana Katkovic, Anastasia, Anastasia um, Klestova, and um, Yevhen Potka. Um, we will start our meeting today uh, by three small thematic panels in which our guests will present their inputs. The first panel will be on cultural property protection in Ukraine. The second on visibility and listening for Ukrainian refugee artists and curators. And the third on science museums and partnerships. After the inputs, uh, we will have breakout sessions, 30 minutes, um, to discuss the topics and you will be able, you, dear audience, to choose the breakout session you want to join. So you can ask all your questions and exchange with our, with our presenters. After this, we will come back in our uh, large session in our plenum. Uh, so to discuss the uh, results 
from um, our respective breakout sessions and to have a last chat with each other. Uh, feel free to use the chat to communicate if you have questions, if you have interventions. And um, for now, I will pass the, the microphone to Anna Leschenko and I will wish you a very productive session. And thank you very much for being here today. Um, hello, everyone. So we're starting the first session on visibility and listening for Ukrainian refugee artists and curators. And our first speaker is Yulia Fish. Uh, Yulia Fish um, is an independent curator, researcher, and one of the initiators of the research group Beyond the Post-Soviet. She graduated from the Zurich University of the Arts with a master's degree in arts, specializing in curatorial studies. And today, Yulia Fish works as a producer and curator's assistant at House of Electronic Arts in Basel um, and curator of the series of exchanges uh, for uh, Pro Helvisher Global Network and, and International Affairs Department. Uh, Yulia's projects are based on performative and discursive ex uh, experiences aimed at rethinking history, exploring the methodology, uh, sorry, myth mythology um, and alternative forms of knowledge and finding strategies for forming new communities and interaction scenarios. Yulia, Yulia the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Anna. Um, um, I will be very general. I hope it's fine for kickoff. <laughs> so today I'm speaking as interdependent curator and founder of the group Beyond the Post-Soviet. Starting from 24th of February and also before, my colleagues and I were in constant contact and exchange with Ukrainian artists and cultural workers. We took um, the position of the responsible mediators, uh, hearing them and engaging our net network and connections around the Europe within the cultural field. <clears throat> Nikita Kaden, a uh, Ukrainian artist, once said to us that visibility can save lives and therefore also House of Electronic Art, where I currently work, uh, launched a platform Focus Ukrainian Artists, providing direct support to artists from and in Ukraine and hear their testimonies through their works. However, I would like to focus um, on several aspects that I have experienced and learned um, during actually uh, last time and especially last days, more than 100 days um, um, first of all, uh, we have to listen and hear Ukrainian artists and cultural workers uh, acting accordingly to their needs, hearing um, and uh, um, within this hearing, trying to comprehend and understand. I um, define hearing and listening as two uh, very active processes. And it struck my attention that some cultural initiatives go out of the step with the demands and actual needs of cultural workers from Ukraine. As a second, uh, we have to start working uh, in the museum and cultural field on the issues of the colonial violence and imperial past and present of Russia. It is still multiplicated and celebrated within the imagination of the great Russian culture, which absolutely erased voices and traces of the variety of cultures uh, being a part of Soviet bloc, languages, identities, their memories and narrations uh, died within master narrative. And it is important to start a critical reflection on the way history of culture was told and accepted and mediated in museums, supporting the myth of the homogenic Russian culture. How many artists and voices in European collection represent Central Asia or Lithuania or Latvia? Therefore, I see several approaches that could be implemented in the museums, such as active listening to the voices and testimonies of artists and cultural workers from Ukraine and from post-Soviet countries, developing decolonial vocabulary, close reading on the collections, engaging with the variety of narratives and conceiving the environment built of different types of knowledge about Ukraine in post-Soviet present in history. And I believe that uh, if we put and perceive this war as a colonial cultural war, 
uh, and put it in a broader context, it may help us to support and make voices from Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Lithuania, Kazakhstan heard and perceived. That would be it from my okay. side. Um, thank you uh, for uh, keeping it so short. So, Yuda, thank you for your presentation and uh, thought provocative ideas on uh, hearing to other voices and this active listening. Um, now, our next speaker is um, Aksana Karpavets. Aksana is an art historian and curator who currently works as an assistant curator at the uh, Zimmerle Art Museum in New Brunswick, USA. In particular, she's working with the Norton Dodge collection of Soviet non-conformist art, which contains over 3,000 works by Ukrainian artists. Uh, based on this collection, Aksana is curating an exhibition, Soft and Seditious, Artistic Counterculture on the Western Borderlands of the USSR, scheduled for fall 2023. In parallel, for the last year, Oksana has co-curated uh, the inaugural international exhibition Organic Communities at the GM Factory Art Center in Lvov, Ukraine. And this exhibition dedicated to decolonial thinking was to open in August 2022, but was postponed indefinitely because of the war. Oksana, the floor is yours. Thank you for presentation. Thank you for having me here. Um, and uh, for uh, Julia, um, this kind of uh, questions she um, uh, in points she she uh, made, uh, I would be a more practical and talk from my experience, uh, applying uh, what Julia said to to my experience working in the uh, in the American Museum. Uh, basically has a uh, largest collection of Soviet non-conformist art in the United States. Uh, and as uh, uh, Anna said, uh, it's uh, 3,000 works uh, by Ukrainian artists in the collection. Uh, the collection exists um, uh, since uh, 1959, uh, but was donated to the museum and, uh, in 1991. And uh, it is um, interesting that the chief curator of the collection was always Russian. Uh, and uh, all the exhibition based on the collection were called like Soviet design, uh, Soviet non-conformist art, Soviet uh, all the time uh, representing only so like Russian artists, basically. Um, in this collection, we have masterpieces by uh, Ukrainian uh, artists of the 60s, like uh, Ala Gorska. We have um, all the non-conformist uh, art, art represented really, really rich, which we don't have in Ukraine. Uh, in any collection, uh, private or uh, uh, public collection in Ukraine, and and this kind of uh, this heritage, so, so such a rich heritage, was never presented or presented like one artist included in the exhibition called Soviet something. Uh, so. Um, and a curator, a curators who were working with this collection were from Russia, and they were never even uh, realizing what what really do they have. Um, so uh, th this is from one perspective that we need to look at the collections, who are in charge of these collections, um, how, how the art is represented. This uh, uh, kind of only two exhibitions uh, of Ukrainian art was done in the museum uh, with, with this collection only twice by the graduate students, uh, not by the chief curator, not by their, um, I mean, uh, curators working on this position. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems for me that uh, um, 
uh, this uh, like knowledge epistemi constant epistemological uh, violence uh, um, uh, so same in the academia in the uh, europe in, in europe or in the united states that uh, slavic studies or art history it's basically like russian art it's uh, uh, or soviet art which means russian immediately so but the other problem which i see i don't want to talk about others to talk about ukrainians and ukrainian museums and art institutions uh, there are also a huge problem it's uh, not enough financial uh, support from the state and uh, basically it's private initiatives who who funded contemporary art centers the same like gem factory art center uh, i was collaborating for the last year uh, working on the exhibition and i see also huge problems that people working uh, on their exhibition and trying to stage exhibition usually it's art managers and and uh, they, they are not curators, they're not art historians, they're, they don't, uh, they, they can't write a uh, text basically for, for exhibition. Uh, so it's, a, and they had to invite some external curators like me, like Katerina Batanova, who was, who is curating this show with, with me. So, I mean, it's, um, uh, inside the country, it is also a big gap with the no knowledge production, with the production knowledge on the on the arts and realizing own heritage as well on uh, on art. So I, I see it's on the both sides actually. And uh, what we need for this visibility is their continuous partnerships, uh, which train, uh, uh, which uh, in education, in, in training, in curatorial training, in art historical training, uh, we need, uh, I, I afraid only that with the war um, and post uh, and a post war period, um, all money would be dedicated to industry, to uh, rebuilding the cities, the destroyed cities, and culture will be say, again on the on the last place. So, on, on the last place in this uh, kind of uh, things that need to be done. So. Uh, what we need for the visibility is really like this uh, continuous and uh, well thought partnership, long term partnership that help um, uh, help to um, basically produce knowledge on on the site. Uh, um, and uh, from the other side, it's the rethinking of these collections, of the exhibitions, uh, and also to give the voice to Ukrainians. I participated to many, many events uh, recently where, uh, where stages given to in France, for instance, to French people who knows little and they uh, ab ab about Ukrainian context and they take the stage and, and talk when the stage could be taken by Ukrainians who know the situation much better. So this is uh, this is done. This is all. <laughs> Thank you for for your attention. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, Oksana, for your thoughts on this. And we are moving on to the next speaker, uh, Nastya Hlistova. Uh, Nastya Hlistova is uh, the contemporary art curator, uh, master of art history. Uh, the degrees that she got at the Krakow State Academy of Design and Art. Uh, she's a curator and founder in uh, Artist Runs Phase 127 Garage in Krakow in Ukraine. And from the beginning of the war, she has been part of the office Ukrainian team in Graz, Austria. Nastya, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you for inviting me and nice to see uh, so many people interested in uh, the topic. Uh, I would present a little bit uh, the work of uh, Office Ukraine, uh, which uh, is uh, the Austrian uh, initiative, uh, the platform to coordinate uh, the possibilities for Ukrainian artists in the uh, wide uh, understanding of this word. Uh, so uh, basically Office Ukraine uh, is a platform where we collect uh, the needs of artists, of musicians, of cultural workers, of visual artists, of uh, choreographers, etc., etc., and also we collect the possibilities 
uh, for accommodation, for uh, mentorship, uh, for residencies, for grants from Austrian institution. Office Ukraine has uh, three sub offices, Office Vienna, Office Graz and Office Innsbruck, uh, where, and I'm working in Office Graz uh, with uh, the team of uh, Rotor Contemporary Art Center. Uh, so uh, basically we uh, interact with uh, local institutions and uh, local people uh, to understand what kind of facilities they have for Ukrainians. Uh, and also we collect the needs of people who want to come to Graz or are already in Graz from the artistic scene. And then we connect them. Because for people who are coming to Austria, uh, it's really important not to get these basic things or uh, once, uh, one month residency or two months residency, but it's really important uh, to get connections with the scene. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing that we are doing as uh, the mentorship program. Uh, it works like we have the artists from Ukraine and the artists from Austria from Graz, for example, uh, we connect them. So um, we select people with similar interests or similar approach in their art. Uh, and uh, basically this mentor, the Austrian mentor, uh, becomes uh, some kind of small connection to the local scene uh, for uh, Ukrainian artists, uh, which le uh, this leads to joint projects, uh, but also uh, just to communication between people, because uh, as previous speakers uh, were saying, uh, we need to think uh, for a longer time, we need to think um, what would uh, Ukrainian artists would do uh, in a year, would they be heard here, would they be understood here, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, thank you, Nessia. So my session is over and uh, later we will discuss it um, in separate Zoom rooms. I give the floor to Alina and her session. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so the next panel is called Cultural Property Protection in Ukraine and uh, we have invited two panelists. Um, Yevgen Kotlar and Rosalina Bösel. And um, we start with Yevgen Kotlar, who will speak in Russian, and I will try to translate it in English. Um, Yevgen Kotlar is a professor at the Department of Monumental Painting and the Department of Art History of Kharkiv State Academy of Design and Arts. He's a curator of the Center for Eastern Studies of Ksada, a member of the National Ukraine of artists of Ukraine, um, uh, excuse me, a member of the National Union of Artists of Ukraine and the head of the academic board of the Ukrainian Association for Jewish Studies. Uh, this is just a few of his affiliations. His main field of work is Jewish heritage in Ukraine, Jewish art, synagogue wall painting decorations and Kharkiv Jewish local law. He created exhibitions in several Jewish museums in Kharkiv, including the multimedia space of the memorial uh, Drobitsky Yar in Kharkiv. And uh, you will find more on his impressive scientific, artistic, and curatorial record under the links in the chat. And we will also post links to, um, to other panelists who just talked and will talk. Um, yes, so um, again, the floor is yours. Пожалуйста. Спасибо большое, Алина. Добрый день всем. Приветствую всех из Киева, из Украины. Мы сегодня говорим о защите культурных ценностей в военное время. I will uh, I greet everyone from Kiev, from Ukraine. Today we talk about protection of uh, cultural property. При этом мы говорим о музеях, старинных и современных памятниках, коллекциях. Но я, наверное, представляю другой сектор. Искусство — это партнеры музея, те, кто занимается различными кооперациями с музейной сферой, и не только. Um, today we talk about, about museums, about uh, monuments, uh, about historical collections, but I probably present uh, another part. Um, I present the partners, those who work together with the museums. И это очень существенная часть всей творческой и художественной активности 
в Украине, которая на разных уровнях, академической, творческой, выставочной, ну, скажем так, способствует изучению, сохранению и презентации культурного наследия. Um, and uh, so this activity, this cultural activity and also creative activity is a very important part of um, cultural property protection because it helps, uh, helps to, um, to, to protect and also to preserve um, the heritage that um, actually museums exhibit and preserve. Я хотел показать на примере собственной деятельности и собственных проектов, как это работает, в каких сферах я и подобные мне, скажем так, активисты в этой сфере себя проявляют, и что произошло с нашими проектами в ходе нынешней войны. I would like to show a couple of examples from my own uh, projects. Uh, what kind of work do um, art activists and also uh, yeah, cultural activists do and uh, also uh, would like to tell you what happened uh, with these projects uh, during the war time. Сегодня я буду говорить только о своих инвестиях проектах, хотя я представляю Харьковскую Академию Дизайна Искусства, и у меня большой опыт и нынешний опыт переживания войны в секторе художественного образования. Это отдельная тема, если это будет интересно, я смогу тоже ее просить. Okay, so today I'm going to talk only about my Jewish, uh, uh, my Jewish projects, uh, although I represent uh, Kharkiv State Academy of Design and Arts, uh, but I will concentrate on, on this part. Uh, so later, if you have questions uh, to broader topic, to the uh, topic of cultural education, uh, you're welcome to talk about this also. Которая покажет визуально мой опыт в сфере еврейского наследия и в разных еврейских проектах от того, как это начиналось, до самого последнего времени. Постараюсь это сделать очень быстро. Прежде всего, я хотел бы показать вам некоторые примеры того, как война а, проявилась на, в целом на облике еврейского Харькова, для того, чтобы погрузить вас в этот контент, контекст нынешней военной ситуации в Украине. Наверное, этот снимок с правой стороны, который облетел весь мир, он символически показывает то, что происходит сегодня и с Украиной, и с объектами еврейского культурного наследия. Um, I would like to, to show you uh, those pictures uh, just to, to place you in the context, in, in the spatial context of, uh, of Ukrainian cities and to show what, uh, what is going on today. And probably this image is uh, the one which make, uh, made a um, huge round um, through the media and uh, shows what happened with the Jewish heritage today. довольно существенные разрушения, как в сфере памяти коммунистской культуры Холокоста, так и в сфере объектов современной национальной жизни Евреи. Uh, there are a lot of uh, massive destructions uh, um, on the Holocaust memorials, but also on the objects of, um, of, of objects of the Jewish cultural education um, sphere. В этой сфере я работаю почти 30 лет, и моя деятельность, и мой интерес как раз пришелся на время украинского возрождения и еврейского возрождения в независимой Украине. Я как бы современник всего этого процесса. Вы сказали, вы работали сколько лет в этой сфере? 30, почти 30 лет. Okay, so uh, I was working in this sphere around 30 years. And, uh, and um, I was starting working there when the uh, Ukrainian independence and the independence of Jewish culture was uh, coming to fall in Ukraine. И я хочу показать вам некоторые работы, которые отражают и этапы немецкого возрождения в Украине за последние uh, 25 лет. 
um, a couple of uh, moments which reflect the steps of Jewish rebirth in Ukraine during the um, last decades. Прежде всего, это практическая сфера, которая связана с процессами реституции еврейской собственности и восстановления uh, синагог. So first of all, this is the practical sphere, which is connected to the restitutions uh, of, uh, of Jewish art and also rebuilding of synagogues. Здесь я выполнил несколько работ, и по сути я очень хорошо понимаю этот процесс восстановления синагог, с чем он был связан, и сегодня этот процесс в целом завершен. Um, I made some, uh, some Arti, uh, some artistic works in the synagogue, so these are also my works, and uh, that's why I really uh, had a good understanding of uh, what, how the process of rebuilding the synagogues looks like, and I would say that until war, this process was um, actually, um, yeah, was completed. Это всевозможные культурные центры еврейские и различные еврейские офисы. Um, some of my works were connected to the contemporary Jewish life and to uh, Jewish cultural centers. And for example, this is our, um, uh, the office. Это офис еврейская община, вы сказали? Вот это это офис современного еврейского культурного центра. Okay, this is office of the contemporary Jewish uh, cultural center. И офис еврейского представительства uh, Израильского культурного центра. And this is the office of the uh, Jewish representative of the Israeli cultural center. То, есть, то, что сейчас я показываю, иллюстрирует uh, актуальность и важность создания новых культурных ценностей уже в современной Украине и для современной еврейской общины. So, uh, what I show uh, proves that how important it is to show contemporary cultural heritage of, uh, yeah, of Jewish life in uh, contemporary Ukraine. Другая часть работы связана с изучением, исследованием и презентацией еврейского наследия. Один из таких проектов, который был сделан несколько лет назад в сотрудничестве с еврейским музеем в Черновцах, был посвящен теме изучения росписи синагог Буковини. Okay, so this is another part of my work, which is connected to... Um, uh, to study of uh, Jewish heritage, um, historical heritage, and this is a project uh, which uh, which was uh, in cooperation. Now, this is the project where we studied um, the synagogue, Russian synagogues in Bukovina. Russian synagogues in Bukovina, you said. Russian Jewish synagogues. No, 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 no. Just synagogues in Bukovina. Я говорил, я говорил о росписях, росписях синагог Буковин. Okay, uh, so this is about um, this is about the ornamentic or lore of uh, synagogues in uh, Bukovina. Wall paintings in Bukovina synagogues project. Uh, спасибо. Uh, и этот проект показывает uh, разные формы uh, взаимодействия с музейными институциями и с аудиторией. Этот проект, в частности, включал в себя исследование и реконструкцию этих росписей как явления. So this project shows um, various kinds of cooperations with museums, uh, and uh, it included reconstruction of uh, the ornamental art. А, а также Создание выставок, в частности, вот передвижных выставок, которые мы показывали в разных городах Украины. And part of these projects were also creating of exhibitions, um, exhibitions, mobile exhibitions, which we showed in different parts of Ukraine. Один из вызовов этого проекта связан с тем, что эту и другие темы важно показывать не только внутри Украины, но и за пределами. So, um, one of the main um, claims of this project is that these topics are very important to show not only within Ukraine, but, but also um, outside of Ukraine. Еще один проект связан с приобщением творческой молодежи к еврейскому наследию. Another project is connected to how to uh, make Jewish heritage attractive to uh, young people. 
Это создание выставок на основе экспедиций по еврейским местечкам Украины, бывшим еврейским местечкам, и создание творческих работ на эту тему. So we created this exhibition on the basis of um, different, uh, uh, different trips to uh, Jewish places like um, graveyards and also create, uh, did some creative work on these places. И, наконец, еще одна важная тема – это различные академические исследования и подготовка академических изданий и книг. Вот в этой сфере… Да, окей. Another important um, topic is to uh, creating um, academic publishing uh, material and, uh, and preparing the study material for publication. В этой сфере интересен вот этот проект, который соединил западную и украинскую школу Art and Light в едином uh, журнальном пространстве. Uh, this is an interesting project because it connected uh, the Western and Ukrainian school. Как называлась школа? Art Art Judaica School. Art Judaica School, which uh, which which connected um, yeah Western Jewish art and Ukrainian Jewish art in one project. И еще один проект, от которого началось все остальное, в том числе работы в Дробицком Яру, это многолетнее изучение темы еврейского Харькова и презентация этого на свете. Презентация? Да, и презентация этого наследия. So this is another project uh, which started with a project uh, um, of uh, with various Holocaust uh, memorial projects and uh, so this is the presentation on Jewish Kharkov. Сейчас я бы хотел рассказать немножко о теме изучения и презентации памяти Холокоста в Харькове на примере некоторых работ и современных проектов. Okay, so shortly I would like to uh, talk about uh, the study and memory of the Holocaust in Kharkiv on examples of several projects. Эта работа связана с дизайном объектов и памятников для жертв Холокоста. So uh, this work is connected to a design of objects uh, which uh, talk about memory of uh, Создание музейных экспозиций для Харьковского музея Холокоста. This is how the different expositions for exhibitions are created of Kharkiv Museum of Holocaust. И для еврейской школы. And for Jewish school. А также работа непосредственно на территории мемориала Дробицкий Яр в Харьков. And this is our work on the territory of memorial of Дробицкий Яр on the Kharkiv territory. Чтобы немножко лучше представить этот объект в его разновременных памятниках, я покажу вот эту фотографию. Это вот тот бэкграунд, который дал мне возможность и моим коллегам начать целый ряд проектов, связанных с памятью Дробицкого Яра. So this background gave me and my colleagues um, the opportunity to start this work on a memory of Trubitsky Yar Memorial. Один из этих проектов, которые мы частично осуществили, это проект мультимедийного оформления Трубицкого Яра. One of the projects which we partly uh, partly uh, completed was the on the multimedia uh, of Trubitsky Yar. Включал в себя три разных блока работ. So this multimedia project on Drobitsky Yar included three different um, parts of work. Первый из них был связан с созданием анимации и uh, мультимедийного оформления uh, внутреннего пространства. So first was on animation, animation and multimedia uh, design of the inner space. Второй проект, вторая часть касалась создания видеофильма с голосами истории и свидетельств о Холокосте. Second part was on the video film, uh, on the video with uh, different voices on uh, memory of Holocaust. Наконец, третья часть наиболее сложная, это создание мультимедийного стола, который, по сути, является интерактивной историей еврейского Харькова. And third part was a multimedia 
table, which was a multimedia, uh, what was an interactive history um, of commemoration of the Holocaust. Именно эту часть мы не успели сделать, потому что музей оказался под бомбежками, началась война, мы уехали из Харькова. Okay, uh, so uh, excuse me, the third part was on interactive history of Jews of Kharkiv. And this war, last part was not completed because of the war. Еще один проект, издательский проект, который связан с, скажем так, презентацией темы Холокоста на новом уровне в издательском формате для современной молодежи. Um, I, would, uh, I would ask you to... Um, come to the end because we are already uh, running out of time, but we will present this last project. So uh, yes, this is, uh, this is a part of the project on Jewish Kharkiv Interactive Guide. Это создание книги путеводителя и создание вот таких иллюстраций, которые сейчас разрабатывает Татьяна Павлова, дипломница. Факультета графический дизайн нашей академии. Это не полная работа. Я показываю рабочий материал. Okay, so this is the different illustrations which are in work. Они сейчас, они сейчас продолжают разрабатываться. Да, да, да это, это рабочие работы, okay. рабочие этапы. Uh, this is work in progress, and um, part of the team is still working on this. This is a guide through the former ghetto in Kharkiv. И еще два проекта, о которых я хотел бы сказать очень кратко, хотя они очень крупные. Это проект, который мы планируем разрабатывать с британскими коллегами, которые сегодня тоже с нами, который называется «Виртуальный дробовский яр». Евгений, нам уже нужно подходить к концу. Потому... Да, я заканчиваю да, буквально, буквально uh, две минуты. Two more, pro, uh, two more projects, which are actually very, very big, but uh, I present them very short, uh, which I do together with the British colleagues. Идея проекта совмещение звуковой памяти с анимацией. Idea is to combine the sound uh, memory with animation. И последний проект, в котором тоже я только скажу буквально одну фразу, это проект изучение презентации памяти о Холокосте в Харькове в сфере Digital Humanities. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this project is uh, in the sphere of Digital Humanities, uh, Digital Visualization of History of Commemoration of Holocaust in Kharkiv. Более подробно можно посмотреть здесь о разных инициативах и исследованиях. Okay, here can you, you can see on the initiatives and uh, uh, academic works uh, I'm working on. Я хочу сделать короткое заключение, чтобы показать суть того, о чем я хочу сказать. На самом деле, я один из многих, кто пытается соединять искусство с образованием, с различными музейными практиками и исследованием. I'm one of those people who try to connect uh, art with education and with museum research work. Проблем, uh, uh, we have a couple of problems in our work, uh, which I would like to present shortly. Первое, это, конечно, помощь финансирования, гранты, программы, стипендии, которые позволят нам дать возможность реализовать эти идеи. So the first one, which is very important, is that we, uh, we, we need our financial help and scholarships, which uh, will help us to realize our work. Вторая – это помощь в западных материалах, технологиях и подходах, чтобы Украина могла презентовать культурные ценности наследия на современном уровне. Second, uh, just help through, uh, through material from, from West, материалов и, что еще вы сказали, западных? И технологиях. Материал, технологии. So yes. uh, третья, третья позиция – это культурное взаимодействие. Показывать, популяризировать украинскую, в том числе еврейскую культуру на Западе. And the third point is the cultural cooperation and uh, showing the Ukrainian culture uh, abroad. Ну и последнее – это вот внутренние коммуникации между сотрудничеством специалистов отдельных, отдельных институций напрямую. Mm -hmm. uh, 
специалистов из различных музеев. Да, 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 да. And, and the last one is the uh, intense communication between experts and, uh, and workers of Ukrainian museums and museums abroad, so different departments. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Yevhin. Uh, I will uh, proceed to the next panelist, um, Rosalina Bösel. Rosalina Bösel, uh, since May 2022, she is part of the team of the Cultural Property Protection Network Ukraine, ICOM for Ukraine, which is located at the office of ICOM Germany in Berlin. She's responsible for the networking of the actors and the monitoring of the network activities. In her master thesis at the HTV Berlin, she dealt with research on translocation of cultural property her scientific focus is provenance research on Nazi looted period. She's going to present the report by ICOM for Ukraine, which provides insight into the developments of cultural property protection in Ukraine. Uh, Rosalina, the floor is yours and we can't see you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alina. I have no idea why my camera just switched off. Um, I don't know if you can do that remotely i'm trying to click on it again and again but it just won't start um, oh, well. no Bye. i i have honestly no idea because it's been working before um yeah i'm sorry but we will keep we will keep trying maybe while you're talking because you don't have presentation to show right I don't have a presentation to show. Um, I can maybe just share my screen and show you the um, the the icon website. Um, but I, I'm very sorry. I don't know how this okay. can happen. I don't know what you what do you prefer? Is just my voice from the off or? Um, yeah, I mean, we, are, we are working on it. Our technical assistance is working on it, so, but uh, we will prefer to hear you actually because the voice is great and clear. Oh, very well. <laughs> and, uh, we put, uh, I put the link to the ICOM website um, in the chat. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, hello everybody. My name is Rosalina Bösel. I am speaking today for, or I am working for ICOM Germany, um, but I'm speaking today for the, um, the for an entire network. It's called the it's called the Cultural Property Protection Network um, that has been set up uh, end of March. I'm just going to start with the brief genesis of the network, basically ever since the war has started, um, not only um, the population of Ukraine has been under threat, but also the cultural identity. Um, recently, there's been the um, 100 days of war, and there was a report about there's currently um, around 380 uh, cultural sites that have been either damaged dis or destroyed. Um, this list, I can share the link afterwards, is um, published by the uh, Ministry of Communication and, um, uh, and Culture um, in Ukraine. And we can definitely see that most of the sites that have been, um, that have been damaged are religious sites. So just like we've seen before um, in the presentation, um, especially the um, yeah the religious identity of Ukraine is under um, under uh, is under threat, and um, so basically ever since the war has started, ev um, also cultural institutions in Germany individually came up with um, with actions in order to support um, their colleagues in Ukraine. And then end of March, the federal government uh, commissioner for culture and media together with the federal foreign office 
um, put ICOM Germany in charge of the um, coordination of a network. In this network, we also, and I think a few of these people are present today, um, we are closely together, uh, we're working closely together with, for example, the German National Library, uh, Blue Shield, UNESCO, uh, ECOMOS, um, the German Institute um, of Archaeology. Uh, and um, so basically, we try to join our forces um, and set up support um, actions for the colleagues in Ukraine. This could be um, this. Um, can be on uh, on uh, various. So the measures are um, are very diverse. So basically, um, the most important step has been uh, sending over uh, material um, in either trucks in trucks or um, by train um, in order to uh, physically protect the artworks or um, um, uh, get, yeah. Pr pr um, how to say that, um, protect them in a way or just like store them in a secure way um, in order to preserve them. Um, and then secondly, we also offer um, digital um, support as in um, the cultural data of uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage can be stored on servers in, um, in Germany or Europe. And we also offer, uh, or we, it's not us offering, but we try to um, be a matchmaking platform as in um, if there's a demand from Ukraine, for example, also from museum staff who would like to um, leave the country, we try to um, put them in touch with um, residencies or um, institutions um, who can who set up uh, financial support uh, in order to receive museum staff and give them the possibility to continue their work um, in a safe place outside of Ukraine. Um, so basically what we as the um, coordinators of the network are doing, we are um, on one hand reporting about the situation in Ukraine, either to our network members, but also to the, um, to the Ministry of Culture and Media. And we try to monitor uh, the actions uh, taking place. And, um, but we are also in direct contact um, with the museum staff um, in Ukraine. Um, so this is basically the most important uh, point for us because uh, we, can, uh, we can make assumptions about what people need um, but the the most important or the most helpful and the most effective way is to uh, to receive demands directly for them in order to um, in order to um, uh, organize help as effectively as possible. Um, yeah, I guess this was very brief. Um, I don't know if I should continue my video unfortunately it still doesn't does not work yeah i'm really sorry for this but thank you so much for this for this presentation and uh we will continue talking about this uh when we go into breakout rooms um, mm -hmm. and go deeply uh more deeply into the discussion and um so now i go give over to sandra for our last panel before we go into breakout rooms. Thank you very much for those very interesting inputs. Uh, we're now moving on to our last panel on the topic of science museums and partnership. Uh, we have two guests today and the first input will be um, done uh, first by uh, Robert, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I'm confused with my documents, here we go, by Robert Firmhofer, um, who's a historian of philosophy. He's a co-founder and CEO of the Copernicus Science Center in Warsaw. He's also the co-founder and organizer of the Science Picnic, Europe's largest outdoor science communication event. In 1994 to 20, uh, 2004, 
he uh, was the deputy director of the Polish radio BIS, and in uh, 2004-2005, the editor-in-chief for the science uh, for science and education. Since 2008, he has been active with EXCITE, the uh, European Association of Science Centers and Museums. And since 2007, uh, 17, excuse me, he's the member of the board of ASTC, the Association of Science and Technology. He has received several prizes, such as the Hugo Steinhaus Award, the Officer's Cross of the Order of Polonia Restituta, and the French National Order of Merit. Welcome, Robert, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, you're probably aware that in Poland we have a very big number of uh, displaced Ukrainians. The uh, exact number is not known, but we estimate that this is up to 2 million people currently uh, in all over the country. And in Warsaw alone, when the Copernicus Science Center is located, it's about up to 300 people, mostly women and uh, children. Uh, Copernicus Science Center is the largest science center, meaning an interactive hands-on uh, hands science museum in Poland, as well as in this part of Europe, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, as an organization not based on collection, but uh, we focus on our visitors' uh, individual cultural and science experience while visiting Copernicus and also through our uh, outreach programs. Um, with the very first day of attack of uh, the Russian Federation uh, forces on Ukraine, we decided to uh, start our activities and we started with expressing our solidarity by uh, adorning Copernicus building, uh, which is located in the city center of Warsaw, with the Ukrainian flags, uh, writing open letters, statements, and publishing them on social media. We also decided to help mobilize the community, as, uh, as you, Sandra, mentioned. We are an active member of different associations of science centers and science museums, both in Poland, in Europe, and the, in the US. And I'm uh, currently the board member of the both European and American organization. And before I brought this topic to the community and invited the community to um, highlight uh, it among its members, which proved to be very effective. I, I hope that Basel will be able to mm, relate to it slightly later. Um, for Copernicus, uh, the, main, the main objective was to allow uh, Ukrainian refugees for the full participation in our, in our cultural activities. Um, and therefore, again, from the very first day, we decided to offer all our Ukrainian visitors uh, tickets free of charge. Uh, we, um, we estimate it's up till now about 38,000 uh, Ukrainians took advantage of that, which is a significant number, and we expect the number to grow by the end of June up to 50,000, and that is what we have planned for. On top of that, uh, we very um, quickly realized that for the Ukrainian visitors, it's important to have an opportunity to um, communicate and engage in their own uh, native language, and therefore we started uh, translating our content into Ukrainian, and in that case, it was a very uh, there was there was a very um, helpful partnership with the Junior Academy of Sciences in Ukraine, our long-term partner, who offered us support in translating the content, which is not just the language but also topical um, uh, topical difficulties because it's physics, chemistry, astronomy. So most translators don't. Uh, for many translators is a difficult topic, but thanks to the, the support we are able to, we still do, we are able to translate uh, most of our content into Ukrainian and made it available to Ukrainian participants. We also offered uh, job positions for Ukrainian refugees and uh, today I signed a contract with uh, our sixth uh, member of the staff um, who is, uh, who will join uh, the front office uh, team so that uh, our Ukrainians are able to communicate again in Ukrainian um, uh, on the floor. Uh, th there's also an explainer joining us, um, an astronomer for the planetarium shows, 
uh, an editor. So uh, there is a good opportunity for the Ukrainian visitors to, to, be, to be able to take advantage of that. Mm. We also managed to uh, buy alliances for the planetarium, Ukrainian planetarium show, not just translated or localized, but it's actually the Ukrainian show for the children um, with uh, featuring the Ukrainian characters, uh, which makes it much more familiar that, and we could see that for um, kids, it's really important because as, at least for a while they feel at home here. Of course, being displaced, but still having an opportunity to interact not just with the language, but also with the with, with the um, uh, cultural content, Ukrainian cultural content. I, th I think it was very important. Um, we, de we decided also to work on more dedicated programs, uh, programs dedicated to this particular public, and uh, I'll just name three examples: uh, our mobile <coughs> uh, traveling exhibitions. Uh, um, locally travel both here in Warsaw and all over the country to the communities where there is large Ukrainian community living uh, and it reaches out again with, with the support of the um, volunteers uh, from the Collegium um, Sintas Warsaw Repairs University um, students, Ukrainian students who volunteer to, to take part in these journeys uh, we do shows and activities based on STEM, uh, meaning science, technology, education, engineering, and mathematics. This is a topic which we believe is important because most of the Ukrainian kids being here in Poland cannot take advantage of the edu public education here because mostly of the language barrier and also simply it's too many students for Polish schools to accommodate them. So they're only connecting with via Remote, uh, remotely with the Ukrainian teachers in, West, in the western part of Ukraine. And now we, uh, we are working on the summertime activities, again, dedicated for the Ukrainian students being here in Warsaw, uh, with this, uh, in collaboration with UNICEF and the city of Warsaw. Let me very briefly tell you about our plans for future. The situation is changing now. Uh, actually, there is more Ukrainians going back to Ukraine particularly to the western part of the country, then coming to Poland, but still the number is very high. And we can clearly see that there is a need for long-term uh, programs that would help uh, fill the gaps in cultural experiences in education, um, as well as connect, uh, as connect the Ukrainian community with the Polish community. In many cases, as I said, the Ukrainian families are hosted by Polish families, but not being able to attend Polish schools, uh, they are also kind of isolated. They feel in a very little community, not have not many opportunities to interact with the peers. Um, and uh, therefore we decided to create a program in partnership with uh, local and regional Polish cultural institutions um, that would combine three important objectives. Uh, High, provide high quality STEM uh, activities for the students, um, provide an opportunity for integration and intercultural experience in terms of um, limit learning of the mutual languages and the cultures, some exchange with Polish peer, peers, and last but not least, a moment of joy and relief. Uh, so bringing those three together, we want to, um, based on the formats that we have uh, that we already conduct uh, at Copernicus. Uh, we want to bring together the Ukrainian and Polish communities all over the country and uh, organize the, a number of activities uh, till the end of this year. Uh, this is the project that is planned here. We're still fundraising for it. Uh, and it seems that we'll be able to start it from the very beginning of September. And uh, another important part of our activity is um, supporting our colleagues in Ukraine. We have a long-term um, partnership with particular two partners, Junior Academy of Sciences from Kiev, a big Ukrainian organization, uh, which representative is here with us and will speak soon. Um, and a, a smaller organization based, based in Lviv, Lviv Open Lab, uh, which is our partner in uh, uh, developing in Ukraine Young Explorers Clubs network. This is a network uh, bringing bring together educators and students um, 
in five countries. It started in Poland with 900 clubs already, then follow, followed up in Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, and other countries. So uh, we have this partnership, and now we can clearly see that this is a very effective format, which helps uh, displaced children in western part of Ukraine and displaced educators in the same part of Ukraine to provide um, a physical, not remote, but physical education uh, for the students there. And it's um, so this format has been adopt, ob adopted to these needs. And actually, I'm willing to let that my only show. It's not a PowerPoint show, but I would like to present you my shirt. It's a gift from Valena Pavlik, uh, the founder of the Sylviev Open Lab. Um, so as you can see, uh, we have a slightly different approach uh, because not being a cultural institution, but not being a museum in the proper sense. I mean, we probably will fit into the broad definition of icon definition, of, um, definitely we fit into the defini definition of museums, but we are not a museum. Um, uh, for us, the uh, focal point is um, taking advantage of uh, our exhibitions and science uh, and technology rela related activities uh, as a tool for cultural experience and social inclusion, including bearing in mind that the, the highlights, the most important parts of these activities are person's dignity, security, and opportunity to uh, lead a better life. So that is how we want to take advantage of our presence here uh, in Poland and our collaboration with the Ukrainian cultures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very inspiring input. Um, and as you mentioned, we are um, going to move on to our second speaker, uh, Vasil Dunyets, um, who's a PhD in political sciences. His dissertation focused on the political, political culture of Polish and Ukrainian young people. Since 2016, he has been working at the National Center Junior Academy of Science of Ukraine as the head of the Department for Educational Programs. He was the project coordinator of the Establishing Science Museum in Kyiv. Um, he's also a member of the program committee of the Excite, which we mentioned before. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for the invitation to join this very uh, interesting session. Uh, I present the Junior Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. The main purpose of our activities um, is promote science among school students all over Ukraine. Uh, we have our regional departments in each region of Ukraine. And each year, more than 250, 100,000 uh, uh, students, school students, take part in different, different activities uh, all over Ukraine. And what is there in October 2020, we opened our science museum in Kyiv. It was the first uh, public science museum in Ukraine. Uh, on the opening ceremonies took part the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, and he gave initiative that, okay, we will need to start um, to open a science museum, science center in each regions in big cities in Ukraine. And uh, we started this project, we had an ideas and we, you know, in 2000, this year, 2022, uh, we plan to open Science Museum in Lviv and Mariupol in Ukraine. Uh, but unfortunately, February 24 destroyed our plans, but not our main dreams. Um, there were some exhibits which were bought to the Mariupol. Uh, unfortunately, today the building and all exhibits were destroyed in Mariupol. Uh, but hope we will rebuild this museum, build a new museum after the end of war when Ukraine will win. Uh, or, and what is important that we understood that we need to create an access to science to continue learning to all Ukrainians because a lot of students, they were forced to flee their home on east and south part of Ukraine, they moved to a lot of, to the western part of Ukraine, like more than one million people. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people moved abroad. And so 
um, in the March, the Junior Academy on Sciences, we decided we need to continue to work. And uh, we have some directions which we try to develop. The first direction is um, Robert uh, mentioned that we started the project Discover Science in Ukrainian. Uh, and um, first, our partner was uh, the Copernicus Science Center. Uh, the Junior Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in partnership with Lviv University and Kiev University uh, will translate uh, educational content of different instruction, website, different scenarios from Polish, English and other languages into Ukrainian because we understand that a lot of our students uh, went abroad but they don't speak in Polish, English or other languages. Uh, there are some now we have new some new partners and we are open for different partners who want to uh, create educational content in Ukrainian abroad. Uh, the second direction that um, uh, our science museum in Kiev is temporarily closed uh, and cooperation with the Lviv Polytechnic University on April 12th, we opened our science museum in Lviv. Uh, we saw that is a really uh, successful approach because Lviv, more than, I don't know, 200,000 st students moved to Lviv region. And um, uh, since April 12th, maybe more than 10,000 visitors uh, hosted uh, by the Science Museum in Lviv. And we see that how we receive very positive feedback from visitors and we decided as a junior academy on sciences of ukraine uh, to start to open such science center science museum in different cities on the western part of ukraine which is related with safety than other especially in chernitsi ushorod ivano frankivsk ternopil and other cities and um, in cooperation with our foreign partners, especially Copernicus Science Centers, um, Excite. Uh, we had, uh, last week we had very fruitful meetings during the Excite conference in Heilbronn, Germany, uh, about that a lot of, because in cooperation with local government, we will receive some facilities, but now we don't have like educational interactive exhibits that's why we are looking for supports with these educational tools, um, laboratory equipments, uh, or interactive edu exhibits. That is why it's very important to create such interactive places uh, in Ukraine. And the third direction on May 26, we, in cooperation with Ministry of Education of Ukraine, Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. Uh, we have organized, and as a partners, we organized a round, in, online round table about museum pedagogy uh, during the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, this event we didn't plan before, like, because um, it was our, our, like a react what uh, happened in Ukraine. And um, there were more than uh, 100, uh, 150 and uh, 50 visitors, uh, participants. And um, what we saw that this was really very fruitful um, round table discussions because um, a lot of museums, a lot of staff of museum, um, they during the, since the beginning of war, they try to save collections. Some of them provide, continue to provide some lessons online to doing different activities. And what we saw that it was really important to collect a lot of uh, different scientists, museum, uh, representatives and educators in one place because each of them have really really good experience now and they want to share the experience to communicate and unite uh, and create like a one platform to speak because uh, we had some connections from Kharkiv 
from Science Museum during the alarm sirens. And the participants, um, she, she said, okay, I want to share my experience because it's very important uh, to like to save our collection. And I tried to speak during the uh, iron, uh, during the alarm sirens from the bomb shelters. So that's really, uh, really fantastic uh, that a lot of how Ukrainian brave in this situation and how museums can uh, play an important role uh, in now. And um, we, mo we mostly work with educators and now we understand that educators are the same soldiers for future of Ukraine because uh, Russians, they understand how educational system is very important because when they um, temporarily occupy some place, they put Russian flag and they go to school, remove all Ukrainian books and say from tomorrow you will have lessons in Russian. So they understand how it's important, but and we uh, need to understand too and do a lot of to create an access to continue learning, to uh, make some research, to study, to change the focus on some interesting um, point of discussing to and uh, meeting of the one place. So in, in that direction, so we, we as a junior academy of sciences, we still continue work. And uh, I mentioned a lot of time in collaborations because really as this top, today's session called Museum and Partnership. And uh, I understand and we understand that now with the really in partnership we can and we will do great projects to, uh, for Europe, for, for Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your input and for your report and uh, information on how uh, how it is going on your side. Um, I suggest that we now move on to our breakout session. Simon will prepare three rooms, uh, each uh, fitting to, um, to, to one of the topics we mentioned. Um, if you have questions, if you want to talk to our uh, speakers, please join the room that you would be uh, interested in. And Let's uh, meet again here in 20 minutes. Yes. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had good discussions in your room. We're going to continue together. The room um, became smaller, so it will be easier to talk to each other. Um, I will um, we just have 15 minutes left, so I will summarize shortly the discussion in my room and then the others will summarize discussions in their rooms. Um, well, we talked um, in our room on uh, cultural heritage protection. We talk um, about the multimedia uh, installation, which um, Evgeny Kotler mentioned in his presentation and about how, can, um, how we can uh, make the whole world participate on this um, yeah, excellent sound uh, animation uh, installation. Um, so there were, were questions, is it possible to bring this installation to uh, abroad or, and so Evgeny told that actually they are planning to give everyone opportunity to participate digitally in this project when, when it is ready. Um, then one important uh, thing was mentioned uh, uh, and this was that the huge wave of solidarity which Ukraine feels right now from over the, over the world helps the country to, um, to unite and to become united and to feel like a whole country, right? Not to be separate uh, between Western and Eastern Ukraine. So uh, he stressed how important the solidarity is for, uh, for Ukrainians. And um, we also were, uh, talking about the importance of cultural events um, in the wartime, uh, that cultural events give people opportunity to, to speak out and to express themselves and that the culture is the first thing which got cut funds, uh, but it is very still very important to, uh, to keep these spaces uh, open. Um, and um, 
we also uh, had a question. Uh, yeah, we, we also talked about material uh, economic resources, and uh, because Anna Lena is coordinating the ICOM for Ukraine network in Germany, and uh, she told that until now they mostly put money into material which they sent in uh, to Ukraine and not uh, did not send money to concrete actors. Uh, so. Um, but we are, um, we told that um, like the understanding is that financial resources are very important. And um, Evgenia also had uh, one question, maybe we can discuss it. Uh, how can Ukrainian colleagues um, work on networks? How can they reach partners in Western or Eastern Europe or abroad? What is the, the best way to create networks and partnerships? Yes. So this was my summary, and I give it over to Anna Leschenka in the room of art activism. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, now the key outcomes of our discussion. Um, at first, what should be questioned within the museum administration around the world? Uh, within the post-Soviet countries, uh, there is a certain dominance of Russia, and when it comes to choosing who should be invited uh, to cultural events, Russians are more likely to be invited than other nations that were part of the Soviet Union. And when choosing the curators for a project or to work with, uh, professionals from Russia have, be, have been seen uh, as people who have more expertise uh, just because they come from Russia, and so other nations and languages should be more visible both uh, within the former Soviet countries and around the world. Um, also, we were, we've been talking about um, rethinking uh, the collections and representation. Uh, we think that research uh, should be done, more research should be done uh, in order to see what voices are hidden in museum, uh, more research, more conferences uh, for, to, uh, to explore that question and uh, what we would expect from the ICOM uh, is to uh, see um, the processes that have been happening in this uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, space, post-Soviet countries um, as part of a bigger narrative because when uh, someone is discussing decolonization, nobody's taking into account uh, the history of Russia and uh, what has been happening um, in, um, in that part of the world. And so there is a certain um, uh, fear of putting the history of Soviet uh, culture uh, into uh, to discussion. And so, you know, basically, yeah. I think that, that summarizes what has been said. And um, so I give the floor to Sandra Baca. Thank you very much. We also had a really um, interesting discussion. And I think um, one very important element was the, important of the, the importance of language and how um, using Ukrainian language is actually quite central for the work that both institutions were doing and how you know the preservation of language was essential because the perspective of going back is very present the perspective of going back to Ukraine and be back and have a continuity um, at, on that cultural um, linguistic level is very important and also because it is a sensitive issue to deal with Russian language um, uh, versus uh, Ukraine language. So the importance of translation was very, very um, large and largely discussed. We also um, wondered how it's possible to reach, you know, uh, people to translate. And it's funny because in our little um, constellation, there was already connections and suggestions on how to do it together. And let's get in touch and let's see how to do it together, which I think is exactly what we're aiming for. So thank you very much for that part of the discussion that was um, beautiful to observe. And um, we also had a question on how to reach the audience. So how are the people um, contacted, um, whether it's via schools and the networks that already 
existed and the networks that have been built. So the importance of networking was also quite present to the discussion um, within the country and without the country, as you know, outside the borders between the, the different uh, uh, countries that are in those large partnerships, programs and networks. So um, it, it was quite uh, an, an important part of the discussion. And a question was also um, asked whether there are similar initiatives uh, as um, uh, Office Ukraine in other, um, in Germany, maybe something that we can join, that people can join and get active um, uh, at our local level. And finally, um, I think um, what, what was also underlined was the importance of the social aspect of those moments. Uh, where kids are brought uh, to museums and are active uh, in, in those activities, the social aspect being very important, that the kids are being seen, listened to, and that their needs are being taken into consideration, so less the content and more the interaction. Um, that, was, uh, that was also mentioned in our group. Um, generally, I had the feeling that there is a large wish for cooperation exchange um, beyond the current situation, that these are things that should be made to last and that there is the hope that the, the partnerships and the contacts uh, are going to grow and, and flourish over the years. Yeah. That's it. Well, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, I think we, unfortunately, we don't really have time to open a discussion, so uh, we will we try to um, sum up. Um, I think it was good to go into small groups because uh, we just realized what are the important questions and the important questions are at the moment are very practical questions, right? Uh, if there is a coordination office, uh, are there financial sources, how to establish networks? So, um, I mean, we have here today two partners, right? Robert and Vasil, who, who are really actively working together so maybe just just ask you and uh, can you give us a short answer how did this partnership start did you know each other before the war vasil how did you contact robert uh, we cooperated with the copernicus science center maybe i know a lot a lot of um, many, many years ago, maybe we started. Um, uh, I was especially uh, before I started to work only in focus on the Science Museum. Uh, I worked like closely with cooperation with Polish educational organization because uh, I studied in Poland and speak in Polish. It's a good moment to develop science, to develop relationships. I think maybe uh, sometime now, especially such meetings, such conferences is a good uh, place, good platform to make some networks. Or maybe we can suggest uh, to create a profile of friends on Facebook and then we can discuss or share some experiences, some ideas. Um, this, this is my idea. Maybe Robert can add some ideas. Uh, indeed, we know each other with Vasil and the Junior Academy of Sciences for many years. Uh, although I would say that probably our collaboration now is closer than ever. Uh, so the circumstances actually help us to collaborate, collaborate closer. And I have to say this is definitely for uh, mutual benefit. I mean, meaning not just both organizations, but also um, the public, uh, Polish public. For us, it's a new experience. You know, Poland is a rather homogeneous country, and now having so many Ukrainian visitors, we learn how to be a, um, let's say, multinational country at least for some period. So we can definitely can take advantage of this, and we can learn a lot. So through these partnerships, it's it makes us um, understand this current circumstances um, easier. Now, I, I would uh, add on top of what Vasil said that. Mm, probably the conferences of the uh, um, organizations bringing together museums, science center, cultural institutions 
are a very good place actually to host and support and, and nurture this kind of collaboration. We've just returned with Basel, I mean, we've returned separately, but from the same conference of EXAID, European Association of Science Center Museums in Heilbronn in Germany, which was held lastly, last week. And the presence of our Ukrainian participants was highlighted very much, start from the very beginning with a being uh, having an opportunity to speak to the to all the participants at the opening and having uh, a special place in the Excite booth uh, where all people, all participants, almost a thousand of them have the have a coffee a couple of days ago, a couple of days, uh, a couple of times da daily, and uh, probably Vasil can contribute most partly uh, a part of it uh, of those activities that there was a lot of direct connections between the museums um and science centers and our ukrainian colleagues direct or indirect a lot of them actually so it's a very good opportunity to establish new collaborations and i think it will be fruitful for all the sites not just during the war but also long after it ends yeah, I can just yes, uh, confirm that and add that we have this Excite conference, but it's a really good place to meet. Uh, and we had a lot of direct meetings using, for example, new technologies, because during the conference, all participants can use uh, application and we can send a message directly to each, <clears throat> to each participant because we read information uh, about which museum, which country this uh, participant, and we can discuss, we can like set up a short meeting. So it's very helpful. It's really new technologies. I think if we can combine all together, it's a good place, as Robert mentioned, conference, a good place to, to develop the network and set up new contacts. And actually some of the meetings were and networking was really amazing. For instance, we had, we had an an informal meetup with our Colombian colleagues from Medellin who work with Venezuelan uh, refugees there. They do a lot of work and of course they have also internal refugees or displaced people from different parts of Colombia and they have already their own experiences which they were sharing with us. So it was really amazing place to share experiences, learn from each other and start future collaborations. So this is what I would suggest when organizing an event is remember about you our ukrainian colleagues and it's i think it's it's a great opportunity for all of us yeah really i would like to say thank you to robert for all for all what you do for ukraine for ukrainian visitors we really appreciate it yeah thank you thank you so much uh, and uh yeah this is the situation in poland is of course different from the situation for example in germany or other western countries right because in Germany until three years ago, uh, three months ago, uh, people didn't really know what Ukraine is, who Ukrainians are, and then um, what, how this culture is different from Russian culture. And we heard about this in, in the uh, artistic activism panel. Uh, so, but now also from Germany, it is a very, very good moment because people are really willing to help. And I say now it is a good moment because this can go back, right? We all know that people forget about wars and go back to their normal lives, sir. But now you can really easily also contact any institution without um, being introduced to people previously and people are willing to help and they will answer. So um, if, if, if you know someone you want to speak to, to cooperate with, just write them and I also know institutions which hire people and uh, they just hire someone who is, uh, yeah, or, or, who lives at the neighbor's house and happens to be a curator for, from Ukraine, right? So you don't really need to need to do a big research and to get to know people. Uh, right now, is a, a people are very welcoming. Um, yes, I, um, I think uh, we finish now, although we just started, this is my impression, but it has been a long day for everyone. And uh, I'm really happy that we did this and, and uh, connected. And uh, thank you so much to all the participants, to the moderators and the technical support. 
Um, and thank you for sharing us with your experience, your forms of resistance, uh, your needs and strategies of networking. And uh, today it has been exactly 15 weeks since Russia started the aggressive war in Ukraine and uh, Ukrainian colleagues has been continuing their work against the backdrop of permanent threats. Um, but we are uh, not powerless. We are obliged and each of us is responsible to share various things, to share resources, strategies, networks, and objects in order to provide support for the sake of solidarity um, and to share our expertise. So, um, and also what is important is to, to build on the empowerment of future generations because they are those who are going to build up this beautiful country after the war. So thank you all. And our online series, Making Museums Matter, will continue our program after the summer break. If you wish to register for our newsletter, please contact one of our partners, which you find on the Compo website, and which I'm putting in the chat right now. And um, I wish you all beautiful summer. Take care and goodbye.